Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Since the Equitable Life Assurance Society was founded 90 years ago, this country has changed in many ways. But in one respect, it is still the same. In those early days, people always spoke of America as the land of opportunity. It still is the land of opportunity just as much as ever. In just a few minutes, in tonight's middle commercial, the Equitable Society will have a special message for listeners who agree with this philosophy. We will describe a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Cut Rate Caravan. Americans are a nomadic people, constantly on the search for a new horizon. We are in perpetual movement, and a native in almost any of our larger cities is a rarity. Perhaps one of the reasons for that is our ever-growing number of facilities for transportation. As it stands now, a person can cross the nation in a handful of hours, and scientists foresee planes in the near future which will jet propel a passenger from New York to Los Angeles between breakfast and lunch. But there are some, and they will always be with us, for whom such speed is neither necessary nor even desirable. They prefer to travel by automobile. And for them, if they do not wish to drive themselves, there are services which are available to satisfy their want for leisure and also for economy. You pay a flat sum to one of those services, and you ride with other passengers in an ordinary sedan indistinguishable from every other sedan on the highway. Tonight's file concerns one of those cross-country trips and what happened to the four people in the car as they were making their way casually across the great American desert. Tonight's file opens in the early evening. Darkness has just fallen. The driver, a lean young man, is seated in the front alone as the car speeds along the highway. One of the passengers brings the sight. Driver? Oh, yes, Mrs. Troy. How far is our next stop? Oh, about an hour. Another hour? Yes, ma'am. Well, will you close the windows and turn the heater on? I'm cold. Oh, the heat is broken. It was all right last night. Oh, it's broken now. Well, then... Close the windows. Yes, Mrs. Troy. Joey? Oh, yeah, Mrs. Madison. Got a match? Oh, wait a minute. I think I've got one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, soldier. Are you smoking again? I am. Well, I'll certainly be more careful the next time I travel. So will we. Driver. Yes, Mrs. Troy. What's the name of those mountains on the right? I don't know. Uh, they're, they're just mountains. Well, they must have a name. Look, why don't you leave them alone? I'm not talking to you. Driver, when I paid for this trip, I was assured that you would act as a guide and tell me about the natural wonders along the way. You haven't opened your mouth since we left New York. Uh, sorry, Mrs. I don't know a single place we've gone through. Turn around, Joey. We'll do the whole thing over with sound. And to make things worse, this this woman has been blowing smoke in my face since we started. Now, wait a minute. All right, all right. Now, let's cut it out. I beg your pardon. Let's see if we can try to get along with each other. We've got another day ahead of it, and we're still going to be in the same car, so let's try to make the best of it. Okay, soldier. 
I'll try. You think you can try too, Mrs. Troy? I reserve the right of silence. Hey, it looks like we've got to stop. What for? There's somebody up ahead waving a searchlight. Well, what do you think it is, Joey? Ah, uh, probably some kind of inspector wants to see if we got fruit flies in the car or something. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, they're always making some kind of inspection. What do you want, Jack? I got a gun here. Huh? Just drive where I tell you. Yet where we're going? Slow down. We're almost there. Uh, okay. Pull off the road when you get past that big rock. Uh-huh. See that cabin? Yeah. Pull alongside us. Uh-huh. Okay, stop. We get out here. I refuse to. Move, lady. I'm not getting out. This gun says you are. You'd better do as he said, Mrs. Troy. You're a veteran young man. You've had some experience with guns. Why don't you do something? Because he's got the gun, not me. Come on, soldier. Let her get shot if she wants to. Wait. I'm coming. Give me the keys to the car, pal. Okay. Here. How long do you intend to keep us here? Until my friend comes to meet me. And when will that be? Stop asking questions. Get in the cabin. Meanwhile, at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Dean Johnson. We go to work. On what, Jim? Two men held at the bank in Rawlins this afternoon. They came in at closing time and took $18,000. Do we know anything about them? Yes, a tourist in Rawlins happened to be taking a snapshot in front of the bank when the bandits walked out with the loot. It's a break. Yeah, the picture's been developed and both bandits have been identified. Who are they? One of them is named Pete Fenton. The other is a George Caldwell. I've heard of them. Well, both of them are armed and dangerous. What was the pattern after they left the bank? Well, they separated. They took different cars. We got descriptions of the cars? Yes, and we've checked on the license numbers. Both cars were stolen about an hour before the robbery. That figures. Now we've got an alarm out on both cars and on Fenton and Caldwell. Don't we have a resident agent in New Orleans, Jim? That's right. He's working on the case, too. Oh, oh excuse me. Taylor speaking. Yes, sir. All right, sir. All right, now, sir. Thank you. Goodbye. Dean, it was the SAC. Huh? He wants us to leave for Rollins immediately. Well, that's one break. What? Look, old Hatchet Face fell asleep. Ah, good. Hey, uh, soldier, you still got those matches? Sure. Yeah. I'll swap you, huh? A match for a cigarette? Deal. Uh, you want one, Miss Paladin? Oh, thanks, Joey. You know, things never work out the way you figure. You know, when I first took this job three years ago, I figured... Oh, get at you. You know, see the wild west. <laughs> so, I, I drive from New York to L.A., L.A. to New York, back and forth, back and forth... What happens? Nothing. But do I give up? Nah. I keep thinking every time I make a trip, what I'll do when the bad man... That's always three or four of them together. What I'll do when they stop me, huh? I'll break them in half with my bare hands. So what happened? Today, we get stopped by one guy. I'm scared of death. <laughs> Uh, Joey, you got any idea where we are? Yeah, I, I think we might be maybe uh, eight, ten miles from a place called Rawlins. Oh, I never knew it got this cold in the desert. I'm freezing. Well, if we had some wood, we could start a fire in the fireplace. I wish I had my coat. Hey, that's it. What? It, it, the gimmick I need to get out to the car. If I can do that, maybe I can get us out of here. 
Hey, mister. What? Uh, mister, we're cold. That's too bad. Well, can we uh, come out and get our coats out of the car? Just one of them. Okay. Come on. Stay right in front of me. We'll go together. Okay. I wonder what he's got in mind. I don't know. He's a cute guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's okay. Think we'll ever get to L.A.? Oh, sure. You live there, soldier? Oh, no, no. Uh, I just heard a lot about the place, and I made up my mind when I got out of the hospital. I'd give it a try. How long were you laid up? Three years. Three years in the hospital? Yeah. Hmm. Kind of rough, soldier. Oh, I'm just glad it's over. Is, uh, L.A. your home? <laughs> no. I was just giving it a try myself. Uh, what do you do? Oh, I've been a lot of things. Car hop, waitress, hostess. Sounds like you make out okay. With all those talents, I couldn't miss. <laughs> <laughs> you know something, soldier? We'll both do okay. Thanks. I can use it. Get in. Okay, okay. Here's your coat, Miss Penalty. Thanks, Joey. And here's yours, soldier. Thanks. Now listen. Yeah. Here's the way out. That's the only door. And the windows are all boarded up, but we still got a chance. Oh. You see this key? Mm-hmm. It's a spare to the car. I keep it in the coat all the time. If I can get out of here and enter the car without him seeing me, I could go for help. But you just said that's the only door. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. But we we got to sit down and, and figure something. There's got to be another way out of here. we, we got to find out what it is. <laughs> Yes, Jim. Sheriff over in the next county just called. They found the convertible that Pete Fenton used in his getaway. Yeah, I assume that Fenton wasn't in the car. That's right. He apparently abandoned it when he got a flat tire. Where did they find it? Oh, about ten miles out of town. Motor was cold, which means it had been abandoned sometime before. Well, that doesn't tell us very much about where Fenton is, Jim. Yeah, I know. As a matter of fact, we were better off before. At least we knew then what kind of a car he was in. If we got a map of that section, Jim... Yeah, there's one there on the residence desk. Well, let's take a look at it and see if there are any side roads near where the car was found. Oh, I'll take it to you. Yeah. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yeah, Harry. Mm hmm. There he is. Oh, one of those, huh? Yeah. Well, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, sure. All right. Thanks so long. That was the resident, Dean. The well, limousine was due at the Rawlins Hotel three hours ago, and it hasn't been heard from. Whose limousine? Oh, it's one of those low-rate cars that run from New York to Los Angeles. Oh. And the hotel says that if the car was going to be late, the driver always called in from Whiteside. That's a town about 35 miles down the road. And they haven't heard from him yet. Not a word. I think we'd better get a description of that limousine and send out a brand new alarm. <laughs> knocking our brains out to figure a way out of here. And that old dame just sleeps away. It almost hey, ages. Yeah, I got it. I got a way out. How? The fireplace. Huh? Oh, look how big it is. Wow. I'll climb up the chimney, walk across the roof, and jump down next to the car. Hey. I can be gone by the time he hears me. Hey, that's good. Except for one thing. What? You going up the chimney. Now, uh, look, you, you just got out of the hospital. Yes, but you all right. Besides, you don't know the technique. My old man played Santa Claus in the department store in Brooklyn for eight straight years. My whole family's great when it comes to chimneys. I still want to go. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. We'll flip a coin. Heads, I go. Tails, you go. Well, okay. Here it goes. Heads, I go. Come on now, give me a boost. Good luck, Joey. Thanks, Miss Pendleton. There you are. Can you grab a hold? Wait a minute. Yeah. I got it. Well, this is easy. 
Hey. What? Take a look at this coin Joey flipped. It's got two heads on it. What? Why, you have to... Sounds like he's out of the chimney. Hear the steps? Uh-huh. He's almost across the roof. He's got to make it. He's got to. He must be at the edge. He must be ready to jump. Oh! Oh! Poor guy. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to a very special kind of person. To the man or woman who can truthfully say to himself, I'm on the way up. You know the type of man who has a right to say those words. It's the man who's looking forward to the day when his neighbors will say to him, Congratulations, Ralph. Just heard that you've landed a swell new job with the Winter Jones Company. If you rate yourself as a man on the way up, it may interest you to know that the Equitable Society has created a special type of life insurance for you personally. It's known as the Equitable Plan for people on the way up, for men and women who believe in themselves and their futures. And it offers these three important advantages. First, immediate protection. The moment you sign the contract, you enjoy the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your wife and children have the protection they need. Second, the equitable plan provides for readjustment in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. In other words, your life insurance keeps in step with your income. Third advantage, the equitable plan is flexible at all times. It can expand or contract as you see fit. And offers you many desirable options which your equitable society representative will be glad to explain to you. So why not get in touch with him immediately? Phone him as soon as possible and ask for full details on the equitable plan for people on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Cut Rate Caravan. It is the hope of the Federal Bureau of Investigation that in helping to bring this series of official radio programs to you, it is helping to educate you in the devious ways of the criminal. There is something you can learn from each program, something you can take away that will enable you to help fight the current and continuing wave of crime which last year saw more than 5,000 major crimes being committed every 24 hours. The lesson to be learned from tonight's case from the files of your FBI is that crime knows no geography. It can strike in the crowded tenement district of a large city, or, as you have seen, it can strike in the middle of the desert. A companion lesson to be learned is that the criminal, whether he is desperate or not, is no respecter of persons or their rights. Here you have seen four people, none of whom have criminal records. People who might be met in any corner of the country who happened to come along a lonely highway in the desert at what was, for the criminal, a fortuitous time. And who, because of that circumstance, that merest chance of fate which placed them on the road at that particular moment, now find their very lives in jeopardy. This happened to them. And unless the Pete Fettons are removed and put away, it can happen to you. Tonight's file continues at the FBI resident agent's office in Rollins. It is later that night. Dean, did anything come in on that limousine? Not a thing here, Jim, but New York said that there were three passengers in the car. Two women and a man besides the driver. Oh, Fenton's trigger happy. If he has those people, we'd better find them before too long. Yes. Now let's check and see if we know for sure yeah. so far. Now look. 
One of the stolen cars headed east out of Rollins after the robbery. Yeah, that was the car driven by Fenton. Okay, now we know that Fenton was somewhere where it was muddy because of the crust of mud on both the clutch and the brake pedals. Yeah. The lab could tell us where that mud came from. We might at least know which section to search. Oh, I'll take it. Yeah. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Chief. You have? Or when? Hmm? Oh, good. Oh, he wouldn't, huh? Yes, yes, we'll be right over. Thanks for calling. Bye. That was the local chief of police team. They've uh-huh. just picked up George Caldwell. Alone? Yeah, and he had the loot with him. He was headed west on the same highway the other car used. That must be near their rendezvous point, Jim. That's right. Chief asked Caldwell where Fenton was waiting for him, but he wouldn't talk. Uh-huh. I think we'd better go over and do a little interviewing ourselves. <laughs> Wet this cloth again, will you? Sure. If I'd been awake, this would never have happened. It was idiotic for him to have attempted such a thing. Just moved his head. Good. It's all right, Joey. Just lay still. Oh. Oh, Miss Pendleton. Don't try to get up. What happened? You got shot. I remember that, but I don't remember nothing else. You rolled off the roof. The guy outside carried you in. I'm sorry I got all the end of this trouble. I didn't know. Uh, Joey. Uh, Leave him alone. He's passed out again. Maybe he's better off that way. He's bleeding pretty badly. Young man. Yes, Mrs. Troy. You've wasted enough time with him now. I'm getting hungry. And I'd like you to ask that man outside if he has any intention of feeding us. That's Just all. Just a minute, you old vulture. It may not mean anything to you if Joey bleeds to death, but it does to us. Young lady, I'll shut, shut up. You? I haven't heard you open your mouth since we left New York except to complain about something somebody else was doing. Now get back in the corner, sit down, and stay out of our way. I think you'd better, Mrs. Troy. Well, if you're both against me. Soldier, what can we do about Joey? I'll talk to our guard. What is it? We've got to get our friend to a doctor. No dice. But he's dying. Nobody moves. You've got to help him. Do you hear? Do you? I guess he's through talking. Oh, we've got to get a doctor. Well, how? I don't know. But I'm going to get one here. Well, Dean, we don't know much more now than we did before we talked to Caldwell. No, he's a pretty cold customer. Well, we can be pretty sure they did intend to meet somewhere between where the first car was found and where Caldwell was picked up. It's a stretch of about 15 miles, Jim. Yeah, I know. We haven't got time to cover that territory inch by inch. Maybe one of the posses will find the missing limousine. I hope so, but I hate to wait. Those people are in more danger every hour that Caldwell doesn't show up with that money. You wouldn't think four people in the car could just disappear in the middle of the desert. Where could four... Mm. Dean, I think that's it. What? We're in the middle of the desert. There's nothing but sand around here. Oh, that's right. I've got an idea. Let's get to a phone. Soldier? Yes? He's bleeding again. Pretty badly, too. Well, I'm getting that guy in here. Hey, you outside! What? Come in here! You hear me? Come in! Come here and take a look. He's dying. So? Oh, you've got to let me get a doctor. You can't just let a man die like this. Listen, you're staying right in here whether this guy croaks or not. Young man. What? If I must stay, I'd like to be moved to some other place. I've put up with these people long enough. You're the one who owns that big black suitcase, aren't you? That's right. I thought so. Why? I just got finished going through it. You've got no right to do that. I found those 12 decks of cards you carry. I use those to play bridge with my friends. That's what I thought. Now, Mark. That's a lie. Lady, I know Marcus when I see him. You mean she has decks of Mark's cards? Yeah, that's right. Where you phone I've got him! Let's grab his gun! No, you don't! 
Now, stay where you are, all of you. Are you hurt, soldier? No, no, I'm I'm okay. You ain't gonna be for long. Wait! All right, Fenton, drop that gun. Yeah. Go on, you heard me. Drop it! Dean, see if he's carrying anything else. I'll cover you. Right, Jim. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. Well, we need a doctor for that man on the floor. Dean, call in the sheriff. Have him rush this man to our hospital. Right. Can we go with him? Certainly. All right, Fenton, you're coming with us. <laughs> Joey Green, the car driver, recovered from his gunshot wound, so no murder charge was filed against Pete Fenton. Instead, Fenton and his partner, George Caldwell, were each given life imprisonment following conviction in a federal court for bank robbery. In studying the mud to be found on the clutch and brake pedals of the car abandoned by Pete Fenton, Special Agent Taylor noticed what seemed to be small seedlings. Because he saw them, the two special agents were able to get to the cabin in which the four tourists were being held. The presence of those seedlings told Special Agent Taylor that the mud had come from a place in the desert that had had just new grass planted. He knew that grass in any desert is not indigenous and must be planted anew every fall because the sun dries the soil each summer and the desert winds blow away the topsoil. A call to the local nursery told Special Agent Taylor that the only place within the 10-mile stretch under investigation that had recently been seeded was a cabin a few miles off the main highway. Given the location of that cabin, the two special agents still were faced with the grave problem of whether or not they would be able to reach it in time to save the four people being held prisoner. By combining sound reasoning with the special knowledge that desert grass had to be planted every year, your FBI was able not only to apprehend the second bank robber, but was also able to save the lives of four innocent people. Just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Did you know that many top executives say, Show me a man's life insurance policies and I can make a pretty accurate estimate of his future success. Yes, your insurance tells a lot about you. When you purchase an equitable plan for men and women on the way up, you mark yourself as a man who really believes in himself and his ability to get ahead. So why sell yourself short? Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Ask him to give you the whole story on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. An intriguing story that proves that women in crime are not the weaker sex. Its subject, swindling. Its title, The Mother-in-Law Racket. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Mother-in-Law Racket. On This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.